Ladies and gentlemen, I'm proud to have as my special guest today William Morgan, who is one of the members of the Citizens Agency for Joint Intelligence and has been for some time. Now, that's all that we can tell you about his identity. You will hear from him his own story, what he's been doing, how he's been doing it, what kind of information he has collected for our organization, for the citizens of this country and of the world. And we're going to talk about, well, I guess uh, you just have to call it undercover operation. This man has been undercover for the Citizens Agency for Joint Intelligence. And uh, I remember several episodes of the show before, sometime during the series that we call the Mystery Schools, which we've done, uh, I believe, 19 hours of broadcasting covering that subject. I told you that we had infiltrated the Lodge, the Mystery Schools, Mystery Babylon. In fact, we have not only infiltrated it once, but many times in this country, and in lodges around the world. So the information that we're giving you on the mystery schools is not conjecture. It does not come from a bunch of people sitting around making up information. It comes from the books printed by the mystery schools themselves. It comes from our members who are actually in the lodge, and we check, double-check everything that they bring to us. Uh, please welcome to the hour of the time, William Morgan. Thank you, Bill. You can call me Will, and I really appreciate that gracious and honorable introduction. Well, we're certainly appreciative of everything that you've done. Uh, tell us, uh, Will, how long have you been associated with the Mystery School? For over two years now. I became a Mason in June of 1991. And uh, what happened? I mean, how did you ever even know about Freemasonry? Um, at first, before I was... Uh, exposed to your information, I was under the impression, as most people are, that they were a philanthropic organization dealing mostly with charity or possibly even in some way associated with unions. And uh, as most CAGI members have come to know, that is entirely not the case. Uh, did you have friends who were Freemasons? Yes, I worked with somebody who was a Freemason, and I've come to find out that that is usually the most common way that a person is exposed to the craft, the craft as they call it. So they call it the craft amongst themselves. This is not something that the public is normally aware. What does the craft mean? What does that term mean? Well, they consider themselves craftsmen because they are building something. And uh, there have been many organizations throughout history uh, with the incredible similarities to the present modern uh, uh, cult of Freemasonry that have called themselves builders, uh, common scenes. Uh, they've associated with themselves always with the erection of a structure or the building of, of, of something that uh, people just do not understand. Uh, we've come to understand that what they are erecting is the New World Order, and they've been working on it for thousands and thousands of years. That's uh, correct. Now, did your friend or friends try to proselytize you or, or talk you into uh, joining the Lodge? Uh, no, not at all. I, uh, I must admit, I did go to them, uh, uh, and I was not entirely aware of the nature of their organization or of what was in store for me when I became a member, or a brother, as they call it. Now, if you had not joined Kaji, would you uh, still be sort of in the dark about the, the true meaning of Freemasonry? Or, or, or do the members really learn uh, the truth about the organization during their, their period of time there? Had I not joined Kaji, I would be as, uh, as empty-headed and as trusting a sheeple as uh, most of the Freemasons in America and across the world are today. They are not taught what the craft is about. Uh, uh, they do not question authority at all. They, uh, as a rule and from my personal experience and observation, they obey the rules w without question and, and to the letter. Uh, now, uh a lot of people out there are going to wonder, and I know that Freemasons are going to bring this up, that if you didn't learn what you now believe that you know about the mystery schools in the Lodge, how do you know that what you've learned uh, while you've become uh, a CAGI member, um, how do you know that that is true? Well, because I can verify for myself. I can uh, get up and check the facts and look and look again to verify what is going on about the mystery schools. But for what the Masons claim to be, they have absolutely no proof or evidence or uh, even works of their own hand to prove that they are actually involved in charity work. 
Now, when you um, began to study, you were studying actually from two sources. You were studying the mystery religion uh, in the lodge, actually, and you were studying what you were learning from, from the Citizens Agency from Joint Intelligence and trying to um, um, rectify the two or, or bring the two together and make it fit. Um, when did you finally decide that uh, that what you were learning in the lodge was really a deception? The uh, the absolute clincher for me, what absolutely decided for me beyond a shadow of a doubt, and yes, I had in my suspicions since I had, since I had very first become a member. Uh, you don't take uh, blood oaths, kneeling before an altar, swearing yourself to secrecy for all time without uh, being su- without the group that you're becoming a member of being suspect. Um, and, uh, but you were taking, you did take these blood oaths. Yes, sir. I took, uh, I took all, all of them, and there were many. There and were so, many. by the time you reach the degree level that you are at now, you've taken approximately how many oaths? I don't even recollect. I know that there were over two dozen oaths before you can even become a master mason in a in a blue lodge of Freemasonry, which is a bit like primary school for Freemasons. The blue lodge is where they are brought in as new members from off the street, and uh, most most men who are involved in masonry for their lifetimes consider the blue lodge to be the heart and soul of masonry because that is where it all begins, and that is where it all grows from. But isn't it true that many Masons never uh, advance beyond the third degree and, and remain in the Blue Lodge uh, forever? That is absolutely true. Uh, whether or not it's they, they do not choose to go forth or whether or not they're, whether they're totally unaware that there is anywhere to go um, is up to personally the Mason that's involved. But many of them stay right where they're at and seem to be content with what they have. So... Uh, these master masons who claim that they know everything about Freemasonry and that they've been a, a, a master mason for 20 years, uh, do they really know anything? They know absolutely nothing. They have been completely deceived from the very first day they entered the lodge. They have been lied to regularly about the nature of the craft, the work of the craft, and the charity of the craft. The own, my own lodge that I'm a member of considers its charity work for the entire last year to be the donation of $100 which is uh, which is a little more than the dues yearly for three members. They gave one hundred dollars to a needy family, and uh, through these uh, very very shallow uh, and superficial acts, they consider themselves to be one of the greatest charity or charity and brotherhood organizations ever to walk the face of the earth. A it, recent uh, thorough investigation of the uh, Shriners, who, who have uh, literally uh, made their reputation upon the fact that that they contribute uh, tremendous amounts of money to charity, but the investigation disclosed that of all the money they take in, less than 3% actually goes to any charity. Were you aware of that? Uh, no, actually I was not. I'm not a member of the Shrine, but I have been exposed to some of their numbers. Um, I was hoping that it would at least be a little bit higher than that, because that's, uh, that says bad things about the, the Masons who are members of the, of the Shrine. And um, as most people know, uh, the Shrine is probably one of the largest uh, quote-unquote charity organizations that there is. You can and, and one of the richest. But most of the money seems to go back into the Lodge or to the members or to the retirement funds or to the payment of the Lodge officers. And this is something else people don't realize, that the lodge officers are paid and they have a retirement fund set aside for them. Is that true? Yes, that is true. Uh, now, this doesn't apply directly to all officers of the lodge. I myself am an officer of the lodge that I was uh, <laughs> indoctrinated into, a uh, duly elected member. They, uh, uh, they operate in, in that kind of manner with elected officials that serve one-year terms. But there is an exception to this rule, and that is the secretary and the treasurer. And the secretary keeps the books, and the treasurer keeps the money, and <laughs> that points that points a very big finger as to where the true power in every lodge lies. Because these these two gentlemen who held these offices usually hold them for years and years and years. And they're not elected, and they're not accountable. Is that correct? They are totally unaccountable. They uh, uh, the treasurer will give a one budget report. Uh, at a certain time during the year, and I listened to this report not two months ago, and uh, if, if an accountant in the business world attempted to give such a, a superfluous report to his boss, he would be fired on the spot. <laughs> now, uh, 
just so our listening audience realizes that, that you're not just some yahoo who walked in off the street and went through the first degree and are now on a radio program trying to tell them you know something about Freemasonry, what is the level of your of your status or your degree or, or how high have you progressed through the initiatory uh, levels? Um, it's not exactly something that any thinking individual would like to brag about, but I have shot like a rocket up the ranks of Freemasonry. Um, much like in America, <coughs> excuse me, today, uh, the Masons like to keep their members busy, busy, busy. They don't want to give them time to think about what they're doing, and they don't want to give them time to think about where they're going. They do this by ritual. All of Masonry is tied up in ritual, and you must memorize this ritual, and it is very, very extensive. Uh, each office has its own whole, whole slew of ritual to remember. To remember. Uh, but I, uh, I worked hard. I, I, uh, I've got a good memory. Um, I, uh, I rose to the ranks, and I'm now a 32nd degree Mason of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry, Southern Jurisdiction, in the United States of America. And this is the same branch of Freemasonry that Albert Pike belonged to that created the Ku Klux Klan, the B'nai B'rith, and the branch off the B'nai B'rith called the ADL, or Anti-Defamation League, is that correct? Absolutely true. Albert Pike is considered to be a demigod among Freemasons, and, uh, and actually uh, a source of light all of his own. He took uh, the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry, which did exist uh, for some time before him, he took it after the, the Civil War and turned it into what it is today. He uh, incorporated uh, much of the pagan symbology into the, the degrees that... Uh, that uh, are uh, still used and practiced today. He, uh, his name is revered. I've seen a, a, a bigger than life-size bust of complete bronze of Albert Pike that was uh, created for $25,000. Uh, some of that money was mine, by the way. Uh, uh, they treat him uh, uh, next to godhood in, in, in the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. Were you aware that uh, Albert Pike was in constant communication and in concert with uh, Giuseppe Mazzini? Uh, in creating, not only creating, but Albert Pike at one time was the uh, sovereign grand commander of all Freemasonry in the world uh, and operated in concert with uh, Giuseppe Mazzini in control of what we now know is the world body known as the Illuminati. Um, the name uh, Mazzini is familiar to me and I, I have come across uh, its connection to the Illuminati in my research, but no, I was not uh, personally aware and, and this comes as no surprise because uh, with the exception of my own personal research, most of my information comes from the archives of the lodges I have participated and visited or from Freemasons themselves and all information is, is questionable at best. Uh, never once, uh, with the exception of one word, have I heard any reference to the Illuminati, and yet my own research points uh, uh, exactly in their direction for the true source of uh, the Masons' power and the reason for their concealment. But no, I, didn't, I did not know about Mazzini. Do the, uh, do the members of the Lodge consider themselves to be illumined? All of them do. Uh, without even knowing the definition of the term, the true <laughs> definition of the term, they consider themselves illuminated. They, uh, they go around, they have that secret little smile, and uh, the, they generally talk, no, not generally, they always talk down about most of the other people in the world. And I've, I've even heard grown men refer to uh, 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 fellow Americans, brothers, as uh, profane, simply because they had not advanced through the ritual of Freemasonry. Uh, I remember a friend of mine who was a young man who was not a member of the Lodge, but his father was. And he had a friend who belonged to another family who uh, was not a member of the Lodge, but owned a small business in town. And his small business was being destroyed by the members of the Lodge, simply because he was not a Freemason. And the business was going to uh, members or, or Lodge brothers. And uh, he asked his father why his friend's family was literally being destroyed by his father and others who professed to be members of a fraternal organization existing for the benefit of the community. And his father told him, and I'll never forget this because it literally crushed uh, my friend, his father told him this, quote, if you are not one of us, you are nothing, unquote. Is this generally true? Is this the way Freemasons generally think about people who do not belong to their organization? I have personally seen Masonry interfere with family ties before. Uh, and yes, this is just how they look at the world. They consider the world to be profane, unilluminated, uh, and, and this just goes hand in hand with the general attitude that is conveyed by all Masons, that they are on their road to their, their own form of godhood, and uh, uh, this manifests itself in, in severe racism. For, 
for all the, the people out there that may not be too familiar with Masons or Masonry, uh, and this especially goes for members of minority groups who have often and usually continue to be excluded from Masonry, and especially for women, uh, I'm here to tell you that you are not welcome in the Lodge. You never will be, and you never have been welcome in the Lodge. This especially goes for blacks, in spite of the, uh, the Prince Hall Masonry, which is the biggest joke and the biggest scam and the biggest insult to uh, any single race I've ever seen. Uh, and uh, and especially for women, they just they do not want you, and they consider you totally ineligible and unable to understand what they do. You told me something the other night that I found just incredible. You said that you could go to any Prince Hall Lodge in any black community and be the doors would be open to you and you'd be welcome. But if they tried to, if one of those uh, members or brothers of the lodge of the Prince Hall Lodge came to your lodge and, and tried to come in and participate in the in the uh, ceremonies or, or uh, whatever you call them, uh, what would happen? <laughs> it wouldn't happen. It just simply wouldn't happen. I, as a Caucasian Freemasonry, can visit any Prince Hall Lodge in the country and as far as I know in the world. I can also visit any lodge, period, uh, across the world. I, uh, I've been told through my initiation that, I've been, that I am welcome in any lodge, but uh, this just does not apply to blacks, no matter that even if the ritual that they go through, and I do not know this for, for certain, but I know it's similar, but even if the ritual were exact, even if the same form of quote-unquote illumination that they underwent was exact, they could not ever, and I sit in a lodge with Caucasian Freemasons. I've never seen a black Freemason sit in a lodge among Caucasians, and uh, I, I, <laughs> I don't think I will. Equal opportunity and affirmative action laws are just completely ignored and uh, considered uh, frivolous and a joke by so, all Freemasons. So the New World Order that they're bringing into being is going to be racist? Entirely. It has Aryan. It has an Aryan background, and that is where it comes from. And and that's been borne out by our research. Why then would the black community form their own lodges and support the bringing about of a new world order that is going to relegate them back into slavery? And I might add, along with the rest of us who are who, are, who don't belong to this uh, religion, and it is a religion, why would they participate in something like that? Well, as you've told me yourself, uh, and uh, most people will understand this, the world loves a mystery, and you can control the masses by dangling a secret like a carrot in front of their nose and promising them the answer to that secret if they just merely do what you say and, and, and work for you. Uh, this, together with man's own fallible, entirely fallible human nature and uh, the, the selfishness of man and the ego of man, uh, they want to be something. They want to be better than than the people around them that they see. And since they have been told straight out that they can never advance to the ranks of Caucasian Freemasons, they have settled for just being better than their own people and excluding uh, other blacks from joining their own lodge. So one of the holes that Freemasonry has over people is that ordinary people, whether they be black, white, Cauc uh, oriental, Hispanic, doesn't matter, they want to be part of the elect. Is that true? Exactly. That They want to join the elite. They, they'd like to look down on their fellow man. Okay. But and now, if nobody coerced you, nobody proselytized you, how did you get into the, to the lodge? I, uh, I went to the door and I knocked on it. We're back in the studio, folks, with William Morgan, a CAGI member who has infiltrated the lodge. Now, this man is no dummy. You have to understand, within two years, he has risen from entered apprentice to 32nd degree Freemason of the Scottish Rite of the Southern Jurisdiction. Now, that's uh, quite a distinction within the lodge, isn't it? Um, well, yeah, it, it can be considered as such. It, it does get a, a, a measure of respect from uh, those who never advance past the third degree of Master Mason. And what is the next step? Um, after the 32nd degree, there is publicly known only one more degree uh, of uh, Freemasonry, and that is the 33rd degree. And you said publicly known. Does that mean that there's more? I suspect that there is, that there, there really is more. Do, do you know that for sure? No, I do not. I do not know it for sure. I've, uh, I've heard, um, there's a man by the name of Reverend Jim Shaw who was a 30, well he actually still is by a Masonic law, who still is a 33rd degree Freemason. And uh, when he became a 33rd degree, he knew a, another Mason who was going through the same ritual who said that uh, he was going to advance even further because he had professed a support for the Luciferian doctrine that they preach. 
So what you have just said, this is coming from your mouth, a 32nd degree Freemason of the Scottish Rite. You have just said, I didn't prompt you, I didn't ask you the question. In fact, you just surprised me because I was going to lead up to this. But you just said the Luciferian doctrine. Can you explain that? I can explain that absolutely. Masons uh, believe in light. It is, it is a priority part of their entire ritual. Now, light uh, to a mason symbolizes knowledge and also intellect. Uh, and if, if you've paid attention to the Mystery School broadcast, you know who the patron god of uh, intellect is. It is Lucifer. And in fact, his very name means the farrier or the bearer of light. Luce is Latin for light and fair for farrier. Uh, this is the true God of Freemasonry, and this is also, uh, to my great shame, the God that I uh, knelt at the altar before and swore my blood oaths to. But when you did this, were you aware that you were swearing your blood oaths to Lucifer and not to the God of the Christian Bible? Absolutely not. Everything about Masonry says and, and uh, publicly says that their God is the same God as any God, the God of Hindus, the God of Arab, the God of Christians. Uh, but but it's just not so. It, it's a lie and it's a scam. And all you have to do is study paganism, nature worship, and the mystery religions of Babylon to see who that real God is. So you have done this study on your own, and you've uh, ch you've checked out the uh, the publications and the doctrines and the uh, symbology within your own lodge, and you've arrived at the conclusion that the God of Freemasonry is who. The God of Freemasonry is Lucifer, who is actually Satan, uh, cast from heaven for one specific reason, and that is because he, like many other Masons, sought to attain godhood in his own time. And isn't that really the goal of Freemasonry, is by their works they will become God? Exactly. It is a matter of works. Salvation has nothing to do with it. There is no repentance of sin, and in their minds mankind was never separated from God, but is able to be an equal to or superior to God. Now, mind you, folks, I sincerely believe in the Constitution of the United States of America. This is not a religious program, irregardless of what you may think you are hearing. Uh, and I'm not making judgment on any of this whatsoever. I believe that anyone has the right, under our Constitution, to worship at any altar that they wish to worship at. I do not agree with this Luciferian doctrine. I do not worship at that altar. Uh, the only thing that bothers me in the performance of their religion is that they are attempting to control and manipulate the rest of us into a one-world totalitarian socialist government with a one-world religion that we will all have to bow down to with Lucifer or Satan as the head of that religion actually uh, incarnated in a human body they intend to install Lucifer upon the throne of the world. Is, is, have you found any, any credence for this? I found great credence for this and the best place to go to confirm this is just pick up the book Morals, pick up the book Morals and Dogma by Albert Pike. He himself will state number one that masonry is a religion and number two that Lucifer is involved. That is all I needed to confirm my suspicions and it should be all that is needed to confirm the suspicions of all the other Masons that are out there wandering in darkness thinking that they are living in illumination. So free, most Freemasons, do they really believe that Freemasonry is a Christian organization? Um, no, no, they, they really don't. Uh, they may themselves be Christians and most in America are, but uh, uh, it is a strict rule and law of the Lodge written into their own constitutions that no discussions or debates concerning religion or politics ever be brought into the Lodge. They do not want your Christianity broadcast. They do not want it uh, uh, mentioned at all. In fact, I have a personal friend of mine who is a police officer in the Lodge, of which I am a member, and when he was asked in whom he put his trust, he said the Lord Jesus Christ. And from that day forward, even though he's a law enforcement officer and vitally important to the New World Order, he has been ostracized. And he has been left out of many of the activities that got me to where I am in the craft today. And I do not think that he will be even allowed to progress any farther because of that. In fact, I think you told me the other night that uh, that, that was the first time that you had ever heard the name of Jesus Christ mentioned in that lodge ever. <laughs> And uh, is, is that true? Absolutely. Or any other lodge, or any Masonic publication, or any writing, or even any words out of another Freemason's mouth. It is just not part of their vocabulary. In fact, I have very firm beliefs that the name itself brings actual pain to their ears. Um, now, we know that the lodge 
will welcome anyone who attends any church, synagogue, uh, temple, cathedral, in, it belongs to any religion whatsoever. Um, and, and uh, But we know that Freemasonry is a religion because we've studied it, and we have people like you who are a Freemason at a very high degree and have confirmed it, and their own writing confirms it. Albert Pike has stated it in writing in his book Morals and Dogma and in others of his writings, I might add. And uh, Manley P. Hall has, uh, has confirmed that. Um, so if Freemasonry is a religion, yet they accept members, people who go to other churches in the, in the community and many different religions that have doctrines that, that don't agree at all, uh, how can they rectify that? I mean, how can you explain this? How can this be? Uh, it just is, and any Mason that holds his religious convictions dear and becomes a member of the Lodge is in direct conflict with his own beliefs and, and his, own, uh, his own faith. It, they, they, the two cannot go together, have never been able to go together, and I don't think they ever will be. And uh, I'd like to ask all of my, well, I'd just like to tell all of my uh, brothers in the Lodges out there, how can you possibly believe that Freemasonry is not a religion? You meet in a Masonic temple, you knelt at a Masonic altar with the Holy Bible or in other countries a different holy book, the Koran or, or many other texts, you knelt there and swore your blood oaths in the name of a deity and quiet respect is demanded in any and all lodges all over the world just like in any temple. You have been living a lie and if you don't wake up pretty soon the New World Order will turn around and eat your lunch for you. Uh, isn't it a fact that, that they believe they're going to be an integral part of this new world order, however most of them uh, really will not be? This is the great joke. This is the punchline to the whole affair. They believe and see themselves as the priest and the priesthood of the new world order. They think that when all things start falling apart, that they are going to be the ones that rise up phoenix-like out of the ashes, bring the world together, and deliver them into the hands of Lucifer. Like I said, they, 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 uh, they consider themselves builders, and what they're building is the New World Order, and it's being erected like a prison around us even as we speak, and the capstone, and uh, you ought to take a look at the Great Seal of the United States to uh, get a feel for this, the capstone of the, of the New World Order, of the building that they're creating, is actually Lucifer himself. And is, isn't that the symbol of Lucifer, the all-seeing eye above the, the pyramid, the symbol of light? It actually began as the symbol of the sun, which was the symbol of the light, which was the symbol for Lucifer. And over the years, it evolved into an eye. Uh, Christians are told that that is the, the eye of God, but nobody ever <laughs> bothers to ask, which God? or who, you know, <laughs> What's the name of this God? Uh, and, you know, if, if a Muslim were to ask in the Middle East, they would say it's the eye of, of God, and they would think that it was the eye of Allah. Allah. Uh, and, and in the uh, Far East, somebody might think it was the eye of Buddha. Uh, but this is never explained. In effect, it really began representing the sun. It became the eye. The sun has always been the representation of wisdom or the intellect or knowledge, which is all the Luciferian doctrine. It is the symbol for the light, Lucifer, the fallen angel, the Luciferian philosophy. Uh, these are these are facts. This is just the way it is. I'm holding in my hand this very moment a an official Masonic medallion that is handed out to many Masons as a gift, especially at entered apprentices. At the very top and taking up the the, the, the main position in this medallion is the all-seeing eye. Uh, and this eye is, just as uh, Bill Cooper has said, a combination of the eye of uh, quote-unquote God, and I stress that quote-unquote more than any other, um, and also it is the, uh, the, the sun. It is a symbol of sun worship. The eye that I'm seeing, the lashes on the eye on this medallion that I'm holding are actually the rays of the sun coming down to uh, illuminate the fellow Masons. It is, it is more than just a religion, as Albert Pike has professed. It is the oldest known religion. It is a pagan religion of sun worship. It is nature worship, and it is incredibly dangerous to free-loving people everywhere. You wanted to read something from a book that you have there. This is a book that I highly recommend that everybody in the listening audience must read this book. You must read this book. You can find it at most uh, religious bookstores, Christian or otherwise. Uh, they usually stock it. Uh, it's called The God Makers, The God Makers, by Ed Decker and Dave Hunt. And let me see who the publishers are here. Harvest House Publishers, Eugene, Oregon, 97402. That's Harvest House Publishers, Eugene, Oregon, 97402. Again, the name of the book is The God Makers, 
by Ed Decker and Dave Hunt. This book truly will open your eyes. Uh, you wanted to read something from that book. Uh, yes, sir. I, came, I was reading this last night, and it just stopped me in my tracks. I'm at page 60 of The Godmakers, and the chapter entitled The Mormon Dilemma. And this book is about the Mormons, and, and once you begin reading it, you'll see through the mystery schools just how close Freemasonry and Mormon, Mormonism actually is. The uh, subtitle of this part is called The Pagan Connection Again. I'll read it quickly. As C.S. Lewis and a number of other experts have concluded, there are only two religions in the world, Christianity and Hinduism, or paganism. One teaches that we are separated from the one true God by sin, and that God became a man to die for our sins. The other declares that men are not separated from God, but that each person has within himself the power to overcome evil and thus to become God, or at least a God with a small g. Hinduism, or paganism, embraces and absorbs everything except biblical Christianity, which is its only genuine rival. Although it uses Christian language to disguise its paganism, just as many Masonic lodges do, Mormonism is le less Christian than it is Hindu. The basic dilemma faced by every Mormon is the direct result of its Hindu roots. In the Bhagavad Gavita, Krishna declares that he comes forth to save the righteous and to condemn the sinners. This is exactly the opposite for the biblical Christ who came to save sinners. The great complaint of paganism and all occult secret societies of which I am presently a member is that whereas one must be worthy to join them, Christianity deliberately embraces the unworthy. And to prove my worthiness to join the lodge, I had to go ask, ask them to become a member. Uh, at the time that I joined, it was against the Constitution's bylaw, the Constitution of Masonry, I should stress, for any Mason to come to me a profane and ask me to join. And in, in effect, actually, isn't the Mormon church just another branch of the old mystery religion of Babylon? It can be nothing else. They have three degrees. They have ritual that they adhere to. They are sworn to secrecy with blood oaths inside of a temple. They have a structural hierarchy that is in the structure of a pyramid, and uh, all those that are initiated into this temple ritual seek nothing else but to climb the pyramid. The reward, the carrot that is dangled in front of their nose to keep them working hard, 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 is that they will experience and uh, attain godhood for themselves. And, and many of the rituals that are practiced in the temple are the exact same rituals that are practiced in the Masonic temple. I cannot personally confirm this, but the research that I am involved in at this time supports this, and also the research of experts who are, are, are far better and far more along in their work than I am, uh, totally supports this claim, uh, and you should verify it for yourself. Absolutely. You know the, uh, the warning that we always give on this show, don't believe anything that you hear on this show or any other show or from the president or Dan Rather or anyone until you check it out yourself. Uh, one thing that I also want to make clear that we have nothing against anyone. We have nothing against people who want to worship in the Mormon religion or the Catholic religion or go to a temple and worship Buddha. We believe in the Constitution, but we also believe that everyone should know what they're getting into. We also believe that if these people are involved in subverting the freedoms of others and bringing about a one-world totalitarian socialist government, which we have confirmed that they are, then it is our business and our duty to stop them. Bingo, Bill, and you've hit upon something that, that is a catch-22 for all Masons. Part of the blood oath says that you can never, and you must swear this on penalty of very painful and bloody death, that you will never, ever release any of the secrets of Masonry to a member of the profane, to somebody out there in the big world. Uh, but when you become a Mason, and as I did, I always ask questions wherever I go. I asked some hard questions, and I got nothing. There were no answers forthcoming. They looked me straight in the eye, and they said, I can't tell you. How do you rectify what you're doing on this show with the oaths that you took uh, saying that you can't do this? Well, um, uh, we've discussed this, and uh, I have had some personal dilemmas that I've had to face. But uh, I genuinely believe that when they do not tell me the whole truth about what I'm getting into, in fact, when they deliberately mislead me and deceive me about what I'm getting into, that that must totally uh, invalidate the contract or the oath of which I've sworn. Uh, it just cannot be any other way. They have lied, and I have, been, uh, I have been honest, and I have been forthcoming to them, but they have not returned it as such. And I found myself in the same position, folks, because when I was uh, in the military, and specifically with the Office of Naval Intelligence, I had to sign security oaths saying that I would never talk about anything that I was involved with 
but later, when I began to realize that I was going to have to, uh, I also understood that the only things that I would talk about were those things that the intelligence community, the military, those in the government were doing, were doing to destroy the sovereignty of the United States of America, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and to bring about, really, a traitorous new government, uh, the New World Order, and that I was not going to be involved in any traitorous activity, and my first and only loyalty was to the Constitution and the Bill of Rights of the United States, and not to some phony uh, uh, manipulation called a security oath, which, which many people are trapped under, thinking that they cannot talk about many of the things they participated in that are actually destroying this nation, destroying the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. These people are traitors, and I could not be a traitor, nor will I ever be. Um, what do you feel about this new world order that's coming? Yeah, it makes me want to vomit. You're absolutely right. They are traitors. They have turned their backs on their people. They have turned their backs on their country. They have turned their backs on their family. They are living a lie, and it's not going to turn out exactly how they think. They are like the cops, the police officers in America that are deliberately destroying the Constitution and treating their own people as an enemy. They can't be a cop forever. Neither can you be a practicing mason forever. One day, that protection that you cherish so much must end, and when it does, does, it will turn around and it will gobble you up like it's gobbling up so many other people right now. Well, not only that, but many Americans are, are waking up. The patriots in this country, the people who really understand and love the Constitution and Bill of Rights, are going to have an awful lot to say about what's happening. And, of course, uh, there are other people like uh, me, uh, like you. Uh, we have a uh, the largest civilian intelligence gathering organization in the world operating full-time uh, breaking this uh, secrecy down, bringing together the truth. And uh, now we're running out of time for another episode of The Hour of the Time, folks. I want you to remember, we love you, we care about you, or we wouldn't be doing this. Tonight's episode, part two of the interview with William Morgan, CAGI member. We have infiltrated the lodge, folks. Hear it yourself. From the lips of a 32nd degree Freemason of the Scottish Rite of the Southern Jurisdiction. Part two of our interview with William Morgan, and many of you are wondering if that's his real name. No, it is not. We protect CAGI members. Uh, we never know, we never tell anyone how many CAGI members we have, where they're at, what their names are, anything. None of that information is given out, not even to other. Kaji members. Now we use the code name or the pseudonym of William Morgan simply because the name William Morgan is significant in the past of uh, the <laughs> the uh, secret society called Freemasonry. William Morgan was murdered by Freemasons after having revealed, printed in a book, some of the secrets of the lodge, and this was done back in the 1800s. Of course, the Fraternity of Freemason denies that they murdered William Morgan. However, uh, their version differs significantly from the official version and from the proof and the evidence that we have uh, spent many, many hundreds of man hours digging up. And one of these nights, we're going to do a program just entirely on the murder of William Morgan. Uh, Will, welcome back to the Hour of the Time. Thank you, Bill. It's a pleasure to be here. And... Uh um, I'm really proud and happy to be here and doing what I'm doing. You know, I don't think uh, a lot of people realize that you, you're risking your life by doing this. The oaths that you have taken, uh, albeit uh, because they were fraudulent, you thought that you were making an oath to uh, the God of the Bible, and in fact you were making an oath to Lucifer, which, which nullifies those oaths, but um, they still, the Brotherhood, the Order, the Illuminati, the Freemasons, uh, could still carry out the threat of those oaths, which is murder. Is that not correct? Absolutely correct. Uh, no matter what I may personally feel about or what common law or the actual law may view about those oaths as taken, the Masons that are involved consider them to be absolutely uh, uh, applicable to uh, any transgression. And uh, they have been enforced, and uh, the uh, blood pun bloody punishments that are part of the oaths have happened to Masons before, and uh, they will happen again, I'm sure. 
Now, you, you are what degree? Let's get that out for the people in case we have some new listeners tonight. What degree are you? I am a 32nd degree Freemason of the Scottish Rite of the Southern Jurisdiction of the United States. And what is the, uh, the official title of that degree? Uh, the official title is the Sublime Prince of the Royal Secret, and uh, that is not only the title of the degree, it is also the title of the ritual that uh, the degree is conferred to. And uh, just to show you how important that is, um, after going through the ritual and getting the degree conferred upon me, I could neither remember anything sublime or even remember what the secret was that they told me. <laughs> uh, why, why is it that, that you couldn't remember um, the secrets of the, of the degree? Well, um, that's a bit of a long story, and I, I won't go entirely into it, but it started off uh, the day I was conferred, uh, began at 6 o'clock in the morning, and they just rushed through it. There was no memory work to do, as in the Blue Lodge, where a person has to memorize the ritual and then give it back. You just sit there and receive in an audience-like capacity. Uh, and uh, when it came to swearing the oath, you merely held up your hand and said, I do. Um, you also did take that oath on kneeling on, on one knee, as you did in the Blue Lodge. Now, um, we talked yesterday, uh, after uh, we aired the, after we recorded the uh, the last program that aired, I believe Friday, uh, on WRNO, and this will air on Monday on WRNO. It will air at a different date on WWCR. Uh, so if you're listening on WWCR, don't let these dates confuse you. But uh, uh, we talked, and, and and I asked you specifically if there was a part of Freemasonry where you. Uh, raised your arm to the square, and what what was your reply? Uh, yes, there there is a part where you raise your arm to the square. Uh, the first time I remember doing that action was in the second degree when it was conferred upon me. You raise your right hand as if you're swearing in. Uh, uh, actually, it is exactly the same position as if you're swearing in a court of law. Your left hand is placed flatly upon the Holy Bible or whatever holy text that, uh, depending on the lodge you're in, and your right hand is held at a right angle with the uh, arm extended, and a uh, an actual square like a like an engineer square is uh, held around the uh, elbow of the arm. It's you're swearing in a square within a square, so to speak, as the ritual says. Now, if if a Freemason were speaking in front of a group of what what Masons call the profane, would it be uh, fair to state that if the speaker uh, stated uh, something about uh, when he raised his arm to the square uh, that this could be a recognition signal to notify other Freemasons in the audience that he was indeed a Freemason? Knowing what I know, I could hardly see it as anything else. Uh, there's no square involved in any other uh, oath swearing ceremony that I've ever heard of, ever, not in a court of law. Only a square is involved in Masonry. It's one of the uh, it's one of the primary tools that are symbolically referred to in all the ritual of the Blue Lodge. Now, many of you have heard this uh, this statement made by someone that uh, that you all listen to, uh, and I want you to make that connection for yourselves. If you can't, there's no if you can't make that connection for yourself, then there's no need to telling you any more about it anyway. Um, uh, let's get into some of the uh, ceremonies. How does this start? It, it begins in the Blue Lodge with the with the first degree of entered apprentice, and it goes up. And you've actually traversed 32 degrees of initiation. Are there side roads off of this? Um, yeah. W well, it's a it's a bit difficult. The Blue Lodge is where everything begins, and the Blue Lodge where Mason is initiated at is called the Mother Lodge from that time after, uh, in specific reference to him personally. Now, once you get past the third degree, become a Master Mason in your Blue Lodge, you are able to hold an officer or uh, hold a chair as an officer inside the lodge. Uh, and uh, you you can spend up to ten years going through the chairs and becoming an officer, but uh, after that um, you can either go to the Scottish Rite or the Yorkish Rite. There's a fork in the road of Masonry, and the Scottish Rite is by far the most popular and undoubtedly the most powerful. Now the York Rite is uh, has seven degrees. Is that true? True. And the highest. Oh, excuse me. The highest of which being the uh, Knight Templar degree. For all those people out there <laughs> who think that the Knights Templar are in no way associated with Masons, you're dead wrong, and you haven't done your homework. Uh, in fact, the Knights Templar, when they first began as an organization on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, were not an order commissioned or ordained or approved or even recognized by any church, much less the Catholic Church, but were, in fact, an order of the mysteries. Uh, they began with seven degrees, and the seventh degree was the highest degree. 
and later, as they added degrees, uh, when these, uh, the Knights Templar uh, were persecuted and, um, um, in fact, many of them were put to death, others were driven into hiding in other countries, and in, in some of the countries they just changed their names and continued the order, uh, and uh, uh, they eventually reached a, a, a number of degrees which was 33. And uh, I took that right out of a very old uh, textbook on the secret societies, which we'll talk about uh, some in a later program, and we'll get into that. But uh, what is the significance that you've been told of the system of degrees? Why do you have to go through this? Um, it's considered a road. It's considered a road to uh, quote unquote illumination. Um, I really believe that it, it, it's more of a system of control and self-government. Uh, lodges are 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 pretty uh, unique in America in that they are self-sustaining and self-governing, even with their own bit of enforcement. All lodges have been granted a, a charter from a Grand Lodge, and every Grand Lodge in this country has been granted a charter from the United States government to operate on its own and enforce its own uh, its own laws and constitutions. If a police officer or any law enforcement officer walks into a lodge while in session, he uh, he. Not only does he not have arrest power, but that lodge immediately closes. Now, this is something the American people don't know about. Now, if these are lodges, they're in states. They have nothing to do with the federal government. How could they receive a charter from the federal government saying that they're under their own laws? And uh, how could it be the law enforcement officer would not have the authority uh, to arrest or um, uh, or any of his other? Um, authorized duties in a, a Freemasonic lodge. It, it beats the hell out of me, Bill. It, it's really a bit of a, a, a contradiction in terms. You have a government that has actually gone out and uh, uh, given government-type status to a completely and secret uh, and, I think, subversive organization right under its own nose. Uh, you, uh, the similar thing uh, can be seen in the, uh, in the Mormon church uh, and in other secret societies that are not nearly so famous uh, as Freemasonry itself. Um, the, the government has, by granting this charter, uh, I believe, uh, undermined its own stability as a, as a functioning organization. Well, tell us about this charter again. Tell us, tell us again what you said before. I don't want anyone to miss this because it's very important. It shows how a secret government can be formed. It shows, tells that these members of these secret societies literally have diplomatic immunity um, and, and can get away with whatever they want to get away with. Not only that, but they have their members sitting in the most powerful posts both within uh, society on local levels and local cities, local uh, counties and state governments, uh, in the higher echelons of the military, and they permeate all the positions of control within the bureaucracy of the federal government. So tell us what this charter is again. Um, okay, it is a uh, it's a document put out by the by the federal government, and it can be any government in the world. Uh, uh, to my knowledge, every government in the in the world has granted that has lodges in it has granted a, a sovereign charter to the the grand lodges under its jurisdiction. Um, uh, I really haven't done enough research to speak at length on the nature of the charter or uh, or what it exactly implies universally for Freemasonry, but I do know for a fact that a law enforcement officer, and we have many law enforcement officers in our lodge, from state troopers to, to policemen to uh, military policemen, uh, they're not cops when they walk into the lodge. They're, they leave their power, their, their badges, and their guns outside, and they do so willingly. Uh, one of the uh, that's a that's a pretty good example, but I think the best example comes from the Knights of Malta. And here's another one for you guys out there that haven't done your homework. I'm reading from the glossary of a book entitled Freemasonry: A Celebration of the Cl of the Craft, uh, which is put out by the craft itself, and it defines Knights of Malta as a Christian Masonic degree based upon the medieval knights' hospitallers and emphasizing the Christian value, Christian virtues. Uh, well, you can leave the Christian out of it if you like, but What's interesting about the Knights of Malta is they actually do have diplomatic immunity uh, as an organization. They can bring goods in and out of this country without going through customs, and they cannot be arrested or they cannot be detained or charged with any crime by any law enforcement officer in the country. They are, they're above sovereign. As far as I know, they're above most government officials that are in the land. That's a fact, and they actually carry diplomatic passports. I know several uh, people personally who are members of the Knights, uh, the Sovereign Order, the Military Knights, of Malta, and uh, they carry diplomatic passports and are, uh, they began as citizens of the United States of America. Now, uh, what happens when a police officer, and most police officers we have discovered, 
or, or at least the ones who make uh, law enforcement a career. And uh, most, if not all, judges sitting upon benches in this country are Freemasons. What happens uh, when you're speeding down a highway and uh, you're stopped by a, a law enforcement officer? What happens when he sees the Masonic emblem on your windshield? Um, usually what you have is a direct turnaround in attitude. I myself am a young man. I, uh, uh, I, uh, I, I get hassled by cops uh, a little bit. Uh, it seems like they always have cop an attitude when they pull me over, but when they see the Masonic square encompasses on my car, and most importantly when I flip out my uh, dues-paying card, a card that all dues-paying Masons carry, uh, the police officer, uh, well, let me just put it this way, I've never once got a speeding ticket or a traffic ticket or have even uh, been harassed in any way when they have known that I am a Mason. It's just, it just has not happened. That is, that is my personal experience. So the justice system in this country doesn't really work, and Freemasons are, in effect, exempt from the laws that the rest of us are supposed to follow. Is that true? Uh, yeah, that can that could be probably construed as, as, as accurate, uh, Bill. It, it, although I disagree, it does work. It just doesn't work the way you, most people think that it works. It works for them and with them and around them, and it works on the rest of you. That's right. Now, what happens when a Freemason goes into court against someone who's not a Freemason and the judge is a Freemason? Um... Okay, well, you have a very subtle inter interaction that goes on. All Masons are taught secret signs and secret words and secret phrases by, and, and this is some of the most... Tonight's episode, part two of the interview with William Morgan, CAGI member. We have infiltrated the lodge, folks. Hear it yourself from the lips of a 32nd degree Freemason of the Scottish Rite of the Southern Jurisdiction. Uh, uh, uh. This is what they don't want revealed more than anything else. Uh, you can stand in a particular position. You can hold your arms in a particular position. You can speak certain words, the widow's son, traveling man, key words and phrases that will let this judge know that you are a Mason. And uh, you can almost guarantee that he is a Mason, too, or else he wouldn't have been able to uh, lock down a lasting career in the judiciary. That's correct. Um, and that would explain why some people just don't seem to ever get prosecuted for anything and others who uh, may commit the same crime or uh, a much lesser offense uh, seem to be inordinately uh, punished, uh, given such a heavy burden of punishment, while others who have done the same thing uh, receive either a nothing or a pat on the wrist. Well, brothers look out for each other. It's just the way the system works. It's a, it's a buddy system. It's a you scratch my back, I scratch yours. Uh, as a matter of fact, in the, obliga in the oath that a Mason swears, he swears that uh, he will uh, uphold and defend uh, a Mason, a fellow Mason, in any, any problem that he may encounter, treason and murder alone accepted, but they left at their election, which means that even if uh, a fellow Mason is a traitor to his country, uh, we know that could never happen. Uh, if he's a traitor to his country, his brother Mason has his own choice whether he wants to turn him in or not. He is not obligated to do so, and uh, uh, obeying the laws of masonry above the laws of the land, he's probably not even going to consider it. So, in other words, one way of infiltrating and controlling our society and our government, both on a local, state, and national level, and the military, is for one of the uh, Freemasons to get into a position where he can then appoint or hire Freemasons below him. When people come to apply for that job, who gets the job? Uh, that's self-explanatory. The Mason will get the job every time. Another part of the oath is that uh, you will look out for the interest of your brother Masons in whatever capacity they may be in. Uh, in fact, it could probably be construed that not giving the job to a brother mason would bring serious repercussions if discovered inside the lodge and may even be a violation of the oath there you go folks uh, all of you who've been telling me that i'm full of crap and that i don't know what i'm talking about and that they haven't infiltrated and appointed their members below them and literally taken over all levels of society uh, both local state and uh, federal and the military uh, you just heard it from the lips of a 32nd degree Freemason. That is exactly how they do it, and that is exactly what has been done. You have to understand that since this country was conceived and, and brought into reality, uh, Freemasons have controlled it. And uh, their goal always, from the beginning, was to bring about a one-world totalitarian socialist government. Our forefathers knew full well the foibles of human nature. 
And this country was described in their own words as the great experiment. And the experiment, folks, was to find out if we truly could be responsible, could rule ourselves, would not give in to the foibles of human nature and give our country and our individual freedoms and rights away. But they knew when they did it that that's exactly what would happen because they were, they were, the, probably the best at understanding human nature of anyone that I've ever read. And I've read all of their writings and letters and works and the Federalist Papers and everything else that they've done. And they knew full well that this people would give away what they built. And they knew that if we could be responsible, if we would not be apathetic, if we would not cave in to the desires of socialism, uh, to the weaknesses of human nature, that this would have been the New World Order. We have failed, not them. They gave us every chance, folks. So don't get mad at our forefathers. Um, is this, would you concur with what I've just said? I couldn't argue with you, and I wouldn't want to start an argument with you, Bill. Uh, I have heard uh, higher-level Masons refer to the United States in their writings and in person as a Mason nation. They, uh, it was erected by them. If you look at the signers of the Declaration of Independence, if you look at the forefathers, you'll see uh, you'll see who who was involved at the very beginning of this thing. And that, I'm not saying that all our forefathers are bad or evil. They certainly are not. They created the greatest nation ever known to man. But some of them were Illuminati, and there's just there's no denying that the course that they set us upon was uh, in 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 the end self defeating for us. Okay, folks, don't go away. We've got to take our break. I'll be right back with William Morgan after this very short pause. Creedence Clearwater Revival, before you accuse me, you better look at yourself. <laughs> Boy, does that apply on this program, you Freemasons out there. All members of all the secret societies that are subverting the Constitution of the United States, the Bill of Rights, I call them cockroaches. I don't know what the rest of you call them. But uh, that's what they are. They claim to be looking for the light, but every time you turn the light on them, they, they scurry under the sink, uh, run for cover. Um, you know, it, it occurs to me that I, I need to tell you folks out there something. This young man who's on this program is a member of the Citizens Agency for Joint Intelligence, and there are literally hundreds of brave men and women all over this country and the world who are gathering information, bringing the truth out into the open. We are all working for freedom. It is the largest and most successful civilian intelligence gathering organization in the world. And our goal is freedom, to preserve freedom in this country, the United States, preserve the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, because it's the last bastion, the last wall between us and freedom, and try to institute freedom in all of the rest of the world. That's our only purpose, our only purpose. We are in support of freedom for all peoples, all peoples everywhere. This young man on this show has risked his life to tell you what he's telling you tonight, and if his identity were ever to be discovered, he could be murdered by the secret societies that he is revealing. He is one of my heroes. Most of the people in Kaji who are helping us to do this, most of them working in intense, secret, in dangerous situations. We have people who have infiltrated satanic organizations and are feeding us the information on their rituals and who they are and what they're all about. And the instant that they were to be discovered, they would be murdered. You don't seem to understand that this organization that I built, the Citizens Agency for Joint Intelligence, is vital, is vital to the freedom of the United States of America and to the world. The governmental intelligence agencies are in the control of the secret societies and are not working on our behalf and never have been, folks. I hope you understand that. Let's go back to Will. You've got something in front of you, uh, and I believe it's a list of Freemasons throughout history uh, that people would recognize their names and if they don't readily recognize their names, they could go to any reference book in, uh, and find these names and their biographies in any library. 
Um, would you like to uh, tell our listening audience uh, who some of these people are? Uh, yeah, there's some really uh, names that uh, you'll really recognize here. But before I do, let me thank you, Bill Cooper, for reminding me that my brothers might murder me just for telling the truth. Um, here's one. Colonel Buzz Aldrin. Simon Bolivar. Uh, Omar Bradley. Edmund Burke. Richard Byrd. Kit Carson. Um, Walter Chrysler, Buffalo Bill Cody, Ty Cobb, Winston Churchill, uh, the list just goes on and on, and Gordon Cooper, Edwin Drake, Jack Dempsey, Cecil B. DeMille. You know, you mentioned Winston Churchill, and uh, one of the things that, uh, that the listening audience don't, that does not know is that not only Winston Churchill was a Freemason, but so was Harry Truman, and so was Mr. Stalin. So when they had their meeting at Yalta, here was three 33rd degree Freemasons deciding the fate of the world. And for all of you who couldn't figure out why they made the decisions that they made at Yalta that so screwed up the world, now you know. Uh, please continue, Will. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. Yeah, they should have just held that Yalta meeting in a lodge and been a bit open about it. Um, okay, here's some, uh, here's some more for us. Uh, Duke Ellington, Henry Ford, Benjamin Franklin, Clark Gable, John Glenn, uh, Glett, uh, Richard Gatlin, inventor of the Gatling gun, Samuel Gompers, uh, Prince Hall, Manley Palmer, uh, oh yeah, Joseph Guillotine, who invented the guillotine. We'll be seeing more of that later. Oh, uh, boy. <laughs> There's just simply not time. Edgar Hoover, uh, Sam Houston. Uh, For those of you who did not understand his reference to, uh, we'll be seeing more of the guillotine later. When the New World Order actually succeeds in taking control of the world, executions will be public, and the secret societies believe in blood atonement. In other words, you can only atone for your wrongdoing by your works or by the shedding of your blood, blood atonement. So in these public executions, there will have to be the maximum amount of blood. Public uh, executions will be held as a le object lesson to the rest of the population not to oppose the New World Order, for it is uh, the most terrible, terrifying uh, experience to see someone uh, literally beheaded uh, is intended to cow uh, everyone else and is, in fact, will be, in fact, a uh, ritualistic sacrifice uh, to the god of the secret societies, who we all know now is Lucifer, also known as Satan. Yeah, you know, Bill, it just dawned on me just what a fun guy you really are. Uh, here's, <laughs> here's, some, uh, here's a short list of presidents of the United States who have been Masons. George Washington, James Monroe, Andrew Jackson, James Polk, or, or, yeah, James Polk, James Buchanan, Andrew Johnson, James Garfield, William McKinley, Teddy Roosevelt, William Taft, Warren Harding, Franklin Roosevelt, Harry Truman, Lyndon Johnson, Gerald Ford, and I also know for a fact that George Bush is a Mason and that Ronald Reagan was made a Mason on site. Uh, <laughs> Like I said, the list just goes on and on, and uh, these are not even a partial, partial fraction of a percent of the famous Masons that have existed throughout history. Well, John Wayne was a Freemason, wasn't he? The Duke. The Duke was a Freemason. Absolutely true. And, uh, you know, we're not in any way belittling the accomplishments or the contributions to society of any of these people. We just wanted to let you know that this covers all areas of society, all levels of society, all occupations, and that many famous people whom you all recognize uh, have, have been or are uh, members of these secret societies. Now, many of them are taken in as window dressing. In other words, they don't really know what they're a part of. They're told that it's a fraternal uh, organization existing for the good of the community. And, of course, in any organization, if you can get famous celebrities to belong, that's a feather in your cap because the public, for some reason, thinks that if a celebrity belongs to something, then there can be nothing wrong with it. What sheeple? What, what total crap? But that's the way uh, people believe. Um, that, that's absolutely true. Most of the celebrity names that I mention in this list are there just simply as window dressings to give, to give a good appearance to the craft, but some of them absolutely are not. And I'm reading for, still from, the, from this uh, book published by Masonic Publishing Company, and it states that Joseph Smith, founder of the Mormon Church, was absolutely and undeniably a Freemason. Uh, did you find Giuseppe Mazzini in there? Yeah, I sure did. I should have done the homework. It's Giuseppe Mazzini, 1805-1872, Italian patriot. He was also uh, one of the um, 
the uh, best friends and correspondents of Albert Pike, who was the head of world Freemasonry for a while and the head of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry in this country. He established uh, with others the Ku Klux Klan, um, the branch of Freemasonry known as B'nai B'rith, which uh, the ADL operates out of. And the ADL, folks, for those of you who don't know it, are under intense investigation now for spying upon agencies and, um, and departments of the United States government and police uh, departments and actually stealing records and passing them on uh, to the secret societies and to the state of Israel. So uh, you'd really better wake up out there and don't, don't give me this stuff that it's the Jews, that it's the blacks, that it's this, it's that. It's not. It's not. Ordinary people like you and me, I don't care what their skin color is, I don't care what their religion is, are just like you and me, and all they want to do is live in peace. There are elements and organizations and people. Tonight's episode, part two of the interview with William Morgan, Kaji member. We have infiltrated the lodge, folks. Hear it yourself from the lips of a 32nd degree Freemason of the Scottish Rite of the Southern jurisdiction belonging to all the different ethnic groups all of the different religions all of the different organizations corporations governments anything that you want to name belong to these secret societies the Jews have been used as scapegoats throughout history the Freemasonic organization and the secret societies in general are racist they believe that the um, the races, uh, the white Caucasian races in uh, Europe, Germany, uh, England, uh, uh, are the superior race, are the real Israelites. Uh, they are the ones who have orchestrated and brought about the state of Israel. They are the ones who, um, who maintain the force of Zionism active in the world. Uh, the Mormon church is a great part of this. Um, you will, I mean, if you just get down and dirty on this, you'll find that what I'm telling you is absolutely true. And one of their main weapons that they use against us is to divide us against each other so that while we're running around stabbing each other in the back, they are putting the chains on all of us. And when are you people going to realize that and understand it? All during the Cold War, there were no Russian families sitting around their table plotting on how to do away with Americans, and there weren't any American families doing that either. All of us were concerned with our children, with putting food on the table, with ed educating our children, with trying to build some kind of a good life. That's all that ordinary people care about. It doesn't matter what race they belong to, what religion they belong to. Bravo, Bill. If there's a lesson that the listeners can go home with, it is, it is that. Stop this racist divisionism, come together, and see the enemy for who it is. Uh, I should, like I said on the last program, you cannot, be a, you cannot enjoy the protection of the secret societies forever. With a little bit of homework, you can find out who financed Hitler in World War II. And uh, anybody that knows history knows that as soon as Hitler got to where he was at in power, who did he initiate a pogrom against? It wasn't just Jews. He got rid of all the Freemasons who were the window dressing in, the, in, in Germany and in Austria, who put him where he was at and protected his interests. He zapped them. He nuked them. They were gone. They joined the Jews and the gypsies in the concentration camps, and they were never heard from again. And to this day, uh, many German Freemasons were a small flower on their lapel in remembrance of that tragic event. You cannot enjoy that protection forever. You are doomed to fail if you depend on these people for your life. That's correct. And remember, the primary method that they use is this. Conflict creates change. They create the conflict that they know will bring about the solution that they want. They get it to appear as if the people are screaming for the solution, and then they give it to them, <laughs> something that the people would never have accepted in the first place. But remember, conflict creates change. They believe in the Hegelian principle of conflict uh, uh, resolution. You have a thesis, an antithesis, and these, the clash of these two creates the solution to the problem which they've been aiming for all along. Uh, now you also have to understand that controlled conflict creates desired results or change. So the method of bringing about controlled conflict is to have your people leading both sides of the conflict. 
So when you talk about Republican or Democrat, forget it. At the highest level, they're both the same. When you talk about populist versus communist or whatever it is, forget it. At the highest level, they all belong to the same organization. When you look around in the Patriot Movement, remember most of the leaders in the Patriot Movement are on the same side and belong to the same organizations as the leaders of the secret societies that are trying to destroy this country. The conflict between the two, which they are trying to create now, will ensure the destruction of the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and then they will step forward with the answer. A thousand years of peace under the United Nations, but you're going to have to make concessions to get it. You're going to have to give up your freedoms, your individual rights, but they will protect you if you buy that, folks, you are indeed a fool. Does this confirm what you've discovered in your quest for the truth? It certainly does. It is history repeating itself with empty promises of, of, of nirvana and utopia on earth that has never come true, and you always have to be the one to pay for it. Always. Uh, uh, it's, it's just these people do not believe in a fair fight. They do not join a race that they have not fixed. It is... They just, they, they don't take those kind of risks. Okay, I've got, you've got about 10 seconds. If you had the ability to say something to the American people and to the world, what would it be? Uh, it would be the wake up, folks. Look, uh, you've got an enemy out there. They're coming together. And there's a convention of Southern Baptists that have, uh, that have uh, come against the Freemasons meeting in Houston in 15, 16, 17 of June of this year. I suggest that you look into that. That's right, folks. And good night. Thank you, Will, for being our special guest and for putting yourself in danger for all of the rest of our freedoms and for freedom of the, of the world. Uh, I, for one, appreciate that. You are my hero. Good night, and God bless you all. I'm William Cooper, and you're listening to The Hour of the Time. Tonight, episode number 21 in our series on the Mystery Babylon and the third hour of interview with William Morgan. Welcome, Will, once again to the hour of the time. Thanks, Bill. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, tonight, we uh, decided that we're going to talk about some of the symbology connected with the rites of Freemasonry, uh, the secret symbols of identification and uh, things of that nature. Uh, wherever you want to start, go right ahead. Okay, well, <clears throat> um, the, all the important symbols and, uh, 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 and passwords are, are incorporated into the first three degrees. Um, the, the handshake, I think, is the most widely used Masonic uh, uh, symbol. It, uh, it consists of an ordinary handshake, except the thumb of the person who is a mason goes onto the third knuckle of the right hand of the person he's shaking hands with. If you've ever shaken hands with somebody and they seem to have a funny grip, or possibly even, I always thought it seemed kind of feminine to me because the hand just wasn't strongly wrapped around your hand when you're shaking hands with somebody, you can have a pretty good idea that they're trying to feel you out and see whether you're a mason like they are. The uh, first two degrees, that was the hand grip of the third degree, the first two degrees are the same except the first degree, the thumb goes on the first knuckle, and the second degree, the thumb goes on the second knuckle. But uh, those are very, very rarely used. And in the master mason, or the third degree, the thumb is on the third knuckle. That's correct? Uh, yes, sir. And, uh, and how would you reply to that if you were, in fact, a, a Freemason? Um, you do the exact same. It becomes a, a combined grip, and your thumb is on his third knuckle, and his thumb will be on your third knuckle. And... Uh, uh, it's, uh, you can't miss it if somebody tries to slip you this handshake. So it's, it's not really a true handshake in the, in, the, uh, in the sense of the word that most people have learned to shake hands. You don't have a full grip of the other person's hand, but rather you just have a sort of a loose grip uh, on their fingers and your thumb is either on the first, second, or third knuckle and you're sort of digging with that thumb to try to get a reaction to see if the other person is, uh, is indeed a Freemason. And at what level? Uh, that, that's that's true. Uh, that, that's true. And if uh, if they do not respond as such, uh, the person will withdraw his hand quickly. But if he's not sure, he'll seem to kind of extend his grip just a little bit to kind of give you a chance to to uh, return the uh, return the sign. They call it a sign. 
Now, uh, besides the the handshake, what other uh, signs or signals uh, are used to identify one Freemason to another? The most subtle one, and the one that you often have to look out for in public places, is how a man stands. His the position of his feet will be a dead giveaway. Most people stand in just a, a leisurely uh, a position with their feet. Uh, um, pointing outward just a slight, just slightly, but a, uh, a Freemason will stand with his feet in an exact square at a right angle, heel to heel. This is the uh, this is the step they call the step of a master mason. The step of an entered apprentice, a first degree mason, uh, is where the uh, the feet form a sort of T with the heel going to the cup of the other foot, and the uh, second degree is an inverse of the third degree with the uh, uh, another square being formed. So. If you see someone standing in a room with their two heels joined together and their feet forming a perfect right angle or a 90 degree angle, uh, you can pretty much bet that that's such an unnatural stance that that is a dead giveaway that that person is a master mason. Unnatural and uncomfortable, I might add, to, <laughs> to anybody who's stood the. You're, you're forced to stand like this when you uh, become initiated, you, and also when you return the ritual, you have to do memory work and memorize the ritual and then give it back before you are uh, raised to the <clears throat> sublime degree of a master mason. Uh, yeah, it's it, it's a dead giveaway because nobody stands like that uh, naturally. It's just not a comfortable position to stand. And why would someone stand like that? Would they do that in a room full of strangers to let other Freemasons who might be in the room know that it's okay to come and uh, and uh, have some kind of a fellowship with them because uh, they're a Freemason? I myself have stood just like that for that very purpose. Uh, because it, it's just noticeable. Uh, it's It's a way of broadcasting who you are and talking to the rest of the world without the rest of the world being able to interpret what exactly you are saying. In other words, if you're not a Mason, you might look over and say, oh, boy, that guy's kind of a, a, a nut. Look at the way he's standing. Uh, whereas a Freemason would say, uh, that's that's a brother of the craft. I'm going to go and, uh, and meet this fellow. Absolutely. That's uh, that's generally the way it works. Uh, uh, most people just aren't aware of... Uh, of of all these signs and symbols uh, incorporated into the craft, but a mason lives and breathes these things. Every time he goes to lodge, he he takes on this position. He does the hand signals. He gives the he uh, will often he usually gives the handshake to his fellow brothers just to keep in practice. These these things are are so much a part of masonry and of masons that uh, that they spot them wherever they go. Okay, so we know the handshake. We know the heel to heel in the right angle. Uh, we talked uh, in the last broadcast about uh, uh, I raise my hand to the square or I raise my arm to the square. And what are some of the others? Well, the uh, the others are the hand signals, and these are also used in every single lodge meeting. And uh, these are to masons. These are what uh, are most easily and most commonly used to uh, communicate between masons their identity. Of the uh, of the first degree, you uh, the uh, hand signal is you take your uh, left hand, palm upward, and put it near your waist, and then your right hand, palm downward, just above your left hand, uh, forming a bit of a cube, and you hold your hands like, like such, uh, and that's the symbol, the hand signal of the first degree. Now the penal sign, as they call it, is taking the right hand and drawing it in a slashing motion across the neck, and this refers to the penalty of the first degree, which is having your throat slit from ear to ear. Now, if this were truly a benevolent fraternal organization, why in the world would they have an oath and a penal sign uh, to tell uh, other members that, uh, that they could have their throats slit? And there are many others, depending upon what degree and what oath we're talking about. Uh, why, why would they do that if they were really and truly a benevolent fraternal organization, bearing in mind that grown men take their oaths very uh, seriously, if they understand the oaths and they're not being defrauded or, or lied to when they take the oath, um, and uh, fully intend to carry out whatever oath that they take. This is not a, a joke. They're not children. Uh, this is not play on the playground. Uh, the, the question answers itself. You're absolutely right. They, this is not a joke. In fact, it's deadly serious. Uh, these are the heart secrets of the majority of the craft. Even though they're not illuminated brethren, even though they don't really know what's going on around them or what they're doing, they have sworn to keep these secrets above all else because this, uh, if a, a, a non-mason or a member of the profane knows these secrets, he can just walk right into a lodge and, and sit down and, and uh, be exposed to everything within. Hmm, I hope you're listening, folks. Uh, 
Now, just for the benefit of, of our listeners or someone who may have just turned in or tuned in, turned in, uh, are any of your fellow brother Masons out here who may be listening? Now, you took the oath, but you're revealing the secrets. Why are you revealing the secrets if you took the oath? Uh, because I took the oath under uh, a fraudulent uh, uh, contract as such. I was told that it was a benevolent organization, that it dealt with charity, that it was uh, arranged around God. All three of those things are bold-faced lies, and I can prove their falsehood. Uh, in fact, anybody can prove their falsehood with, with just a, a moment's bit of research. Uh, there are many more reliable sources than I for information that you can go to to find out the true nature of this craft. And uh, many religions in the world, including the, the Baptists and the Mormons, have condemned Freemasonry as, as being exactly what it purports not to be. It's not benevolent, it's not charity organized, and it's not centered around God. Well, it's, it's funny that you mentioned that the Mormons have condemned Freemasonry when they carry out the exact same rituals that are carried out in Masonic Lodge in their temple ceremonies, and uh, most uh, Mormons are indeed, as was Joseph Smith, uh, members of the Masonic Lodge. Uh, our research shows that the public statements of the Mormon Church are often, and I mean often, contradictory to their true beliefs and what they really practice in their daily lives in, within the temple. They are, in fact, a secret uh, society, a secret organization that practices the same rites as the Masonic Lodge uh, within their temple and have the same goal and that is that the practitioners of the religion of the Mormon Church will in fact become God and that is of course what the um, other secret societies and we're talking right now the Freemasons they're really all the same organization they're working toward becoming God. It, it, it is. It's a quest after Godhood. And uh, uh, all I can say about the Mormons and their many, many similarities to Masons is that a pagan is a pagan is a pagan. It, it's nature worship. Uh, they believe in the laws of the universe as, as being what they have to answer to. And, and, manip and if you know these laws, you can manipulate the populace. It, it's elitism at its, at its very best. Now, let me ask you this for the benefit of our listeners also. Many people write me letters and say, hey, my, my dad or my uncle or my cousin or my friend um, is a Freemason, and I've asked them about these things, and they've told me that, that it's not true, um, that it's all a lie. Um, will Freemasons lie to hide the truth? Every single time, if the truth will give away what they don't want to give away. In fact, I've been lied to by, by, by brothers in the craft that, that are allegedly or supposedly teaching me and instructing me in what goes on. They, if they told the truth, it would scare away their members and would, it would end up in universal condemnation of what they're doing. No uh, reasonable and uh, moral person could, uh, could possibly subject, subject themselves to such bloody oaths and to such total secrecy. Uh, not only that, but the oaths themselves, they're sworn to secrecy. So if you were to ask them to tell you the secrets or the truth about the practices, the rituals, uh, the, the true religion of the Masonic Lodge, they are sworn uh, not to tell you. So therefore, they would, they would have to lie. And the only reason that you are telling is because you discovered that, that uh, uh, the oaths that you had taken and the purposes for which you thought the Masonic fraternity was organized, uh, it just is not true at all. So therefore, um, everything that you participated in, you participated in under fraudulent conditions. Uh, yeah, uh, that is exactly true, and as such, I don't consider myself to be bound by those oaths because I was lied to before I entered into those oaths. Uh, this is common law. This is the law of, of many lands. Uh, it's and it also makes just it makes perfect common sense that uh, both parties have to know what is going on in all terms of the contract before they can be held accountable for for their deeds within that contract. That's correct. And the oath that you the oath that you took you thought were for a different purpose and to a different God than the God that you discovered and the purpose that you finally discovered. So, folks out there, when you go and ask your relatives or your friends or your cousins or your business uh, associates uh, questions about the lodge, about Freemasonry, about any secret society, no matter what name it is, the Rosen Cross, Knights Templars, um, the Knights of Malta, the Order of Saint John of Jerusalem, any of these people. They cannot and will not tell you the truth because it is forbidden to them. And in fact, if they do, they could find themselves suffering the consequences of the very oaths they took, not to reveal these secrets. Now, 
What are some of the other signs that we that we have not discussed? Okay, I covered the first degree. The second degree we've we've also partially covered. Uh, the uh, the sign of the second degree is to hold your right arm extended outward with the uh, 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 the elbow at a right angle and the uh, the hand facing up, palm forward, and uh, uh, the uh, penal sign of that is to draw your right hand across your chest from left to right in a claw-like motion, which refers to the penalty of the second degree, which is to have your breast torn open and your heart and vitals taken thence, and uh, given as uh, to the birds of the birds of the uh, the air and uh, beasts of the field. That's an exact quote from the ritual, by the way. And uh, the third degree um, consists of uh, uh, both hands, uh, palm down, extended uh, outward at the waist, uh, and then to draw the, uh, the hand across the waist from left to right, which refers to have your body torn in twain, which is the penalty of the revealing the secrets of the third degree, is to have your body torn in twain and the parts carried north and south. That is, again, a direct quote from the ritual. So the first one uh, is the recognition signal, and the second is what you call the penal sign. Yes, yes, that's true. And are there other signs and signals uh, connected with Freemasonry? There are, there are many others. Um, there is a, a recognition signal uh, and a penal sign for every single degree in Freemasonry, and I have been through the 32nd degree and uh, have, uh, have uh, experienced all these uh, recognition signals and uh, penal signs. But the, uh, all the signs after the third degree are not nearly as important as the uh, first three. And for the reason for this is, is because Masons in general uh, are just not invited to know all the secrets of the order. Um, it is not uncommon to know a Mason, as you've stated before, who never ever advances beyond the third degree. And I should state now that a Mason who, uh, who is in the third degree, he can be the master of his lodge, yeah, the worshipful master, they call it, of his lodge, which is uh, a bit like an elected, it is an elected office, a bit like president that lasts for one year. Uh, not all Masons are in the Scottish Rite or the Shrine or the Yorkish Rite, but all Masons do know the signs of the first three degrees and the penal signs. And in fact, most Masons um, are really only guilty of joining an organization they know nothing about and for giving it um, uh, protection and uh, and favor and helping it along, but they really don't know what it's all about. Do they? True, true. They, they, they don't. They're uh, they're as ignorant as I was. And uh, if if they're out there listening, I'd like to say that you can follow the exact same path I have followed. Now that you know the truth about the craft, whether you believe me or not, you should go out and verify for yourself. And once you do verify for yourself, you are no longer bound by those oaths either. They are fraudulent and they are they're, they're ridiculous and unreasonable and brutal in many ways. Not only that, but once you do know about it, you are no longer innocent, but you are, if you don't do something about it, or mm -hmm. leave the lodge, or do as this young gentleman is doing, help us to, um, to relieve ourselves from the yoke of these secret societies who are planning on stripping us of our freedoms and our rights. If you don't, then you are... Um, then you are a fellow conspirator and are just as guilty as those who have always known. And you better understand that because I'm telling you right now, patriots in this country are getting fed up. And the purpose of this show is to prevent bloodshed. We want to wake people up and do something about this while we can, legally and lawfully, because, uh, folks, there, there will come a day when people will not take it anymore and they will take weapons in hand, unfortunately. Um, we can see it coming. Anybody with half a brain can look around and talk to people and see that that day is going to come because nothing's getting better. It's only getting worse. And we don't want that to happen. That's why we're doing this. That's why I've dedicated my life. And that's why uh, uh, I've um, suffered so much in my life to try to wake people up is, is to prevent that kind of thing. And they are dead set upon seeing their dream come true, aren't they, Will? They have dedicated their lives, their labors, and, and indeed their, their entire faith to this. And you have not exaggerated or overrated the problem at all. This is dangerous, uh, people. The, these, these men mean business. Uh, the Scottish Rite themselves have taken a public stance totally in support of public education by the government. Now all you need to do is look at how screwed up your schools are, and then turn around and look how screwed up your kids are, and you've got a big big, rich organization out there with incredible political power and widespread influence that is supporting this current failed system. This is just one isolated example. If you are not part of the solution and you have even been just 
a teeny bit exposed to the truth, then you are part of the problem. That's correct. And, and we know that uh, public education, conducted and supervised and organized and funded by the government, is one of the planks of the Communist Manifesto, written by Karl Marx and Frederick Engels. Now, why would Americans ever support such a thing? The strength of our educational system before it began to self-destruct was that it was always handled, funded, and governed, and maintained, and approved, and everything else on a local level. In other words, the school system in my town might be different from the school system in someone else's town 100 miles away, but it would be controlled, governed, decided, textbooks would be chosen, everything on a local level. Our schools did not begin to self-destruct until the state got into the school system and then the federal government began to poke into it. And specifically, when uh, teachers' colleges funded by the Carnegie, the Ford, and the, uh, the Rockefeller Institutes began to uh, change what they taught teachers to teach children. And uh, when that happened, when it became an organized, uh, funded, um, dictated to type thing, then it began to fall apart. And the less control on the local level, the less our children uh, are educated. You've, uh, you've hit the nail right on the head. As you've stated in your own book, Behold a Pale Horse, the, the, the true enemy is, uh, is not communism, but illuminism. When, uh, when the Berlin Wall fell and the uh, Eastern Europe was opened up, it wasn't uh, all the American companies that beat up path to, the, to their door to go open up these markets and make money. There were two groups, and they were both religious in, in nature. One were the evangelists uh, who, who went over there to try to spread the word uh, of, their, uh, of their religion, and the other were Freemasons who stepped in just the very moment that the communists stepped out. Already, lodges have been consecrated in St. Petersburg, in Moscow, and in several other major cities, and they're, they're just popping up all over. You, you've got people, very old men, who actually remember when the lodges were around before Stalin wiped them out, and uh, uh, they're bringing them back to replace the communist masters that they just got rid of. And the only reason that Stalin did away with the lodges in uh, the Soviet Union was because Stalin was a 33rd degree Freemason. He knew how he had risen to power. He knew what the organization was, and he didn't want them turning against him, so he got rid of them. Absolutely. <laughs> they're, they're subversives. They got him, just like Hitler, they got him to where he wanted to be, and he's not going to let anybody get put him out of place with the same tools that he rose to power with. Okay. Well, this uh, we're making a lot of progress here. If you were to walk into a room and see two grown men hugging, what would you look for as identifying uh, traits uh, that would tell you that these two men hugging uh, were Freemasons? Mm, there is a, a certain pattern ritual that goes uh, that, that has something to do with that. It, it, it deals with the uh, uh, cha interchange of the of one of the most secret passwords of Freemasonry, and you must go. You must stand foot to foot with another Mason, knee to knee. Uh, hand to back and mouth to ear and then whisper the secret word in a very low voice uh, and uh, I'm not going to do any of those things I'm just going to tell you the word is Mahabam and I don't even know what it means but I do know where it comes from and it comes from the ancient Hindu religion which is the the original pagan religion and uh, many of the other secret words in Freemasonry are, are, are of an exact same source and they call this the five points of fellowship do they not? they do you, <laughs> you've done your homework Bill <laughs> Well, it's, I, I know more about Freemasonry and the secret societies than most members of Freemasonry and the secret societies ever will. Um, and um, I was, as I've told my listeners, and I've, as I've published in my book, uh, a, a member of Demolay when I was a teenager. I went to exactly three men meetings, and uh, Demolay, folks, is a branch of Freemasonry for children, for teenagers, actually. And uh, I attended three meetings, and my father was transferred to Japan, and I never attended another meeting uh, ever. But I do believe that that's what got me, in fact, I know it is, that's what uh, opened the door for me to enter um, as a member of the Office of Naval Intelligence many years later. Uh, when I filled out my forms for security clearance, um, there was nothing on there for the Order of Demolay, but I knew that it was a branch of Freemasonry, so I checked Freemasonry. And uh, by golly, all of a sudden, uh, things began to open for me that had never opened for me before and which most people uh, who are not Freemasons find impossible to enter into. And um, I was surprised for a while and a little mystified until I discovered the real reason. But every 
member of naval intelligence that I ever met was a Freemason, and most of them wore their rings. What are these rings? How can how can someone identify the ring of a Freemason? Sticks out like a sore thumb. It looks a bit like a fraternity ring or a football ring or, or any other signet ring. And uh, on the very top of the ring will be a square and compass set in a, what looks like a large A shape with the square on the bottom and the compass on the top. Uh, forming what looks a bit like an A, but it's not. Um, you can tell how seriously one takes their position in the craft. The uh, the Masons who are really there for genuine reasons, philanthropic and charity work, they have their uh, their square and compass facing to them. And those that are trying to impress and, and enforce the buddy system that got you in naval intelligence and, and the back scratching whole thing, they wear theirs facing the outside to tell everybody else in the world who they are. But really, the only ones who really know, unless you were to ask them what that ring meant, are our fellow uh, craft masons. Absolutely. I, sh I shouldn't say fellow craft. That's the second degree. Our <laughs> uh, our fellow brothers of the lodge. Okay, folks, we've got to take our break. Don't go away. We'll be right back after this very short pause. Welcome back to the hour of the time. Will you've got something there you want to say? I think. Uh, yeah, I've just, uh, I'd like to give a little message to my brother Masons out there. I know that uh, all those who are listening are thinking some pretty hard thoughts about me. You're thinking things like that I'm a traitor to the craft. Well, <laughs> I'm thinking that you're a traitor to your country. And if you think that I've betrayed my brothers, I feel that you've betrayed me with your deception. If you believe that I've broken my oaths, and even if those oaths are valid, something that I do not believe, I think they're null and void, well, then I just have to say this, so what? We all got to go. Now, my brothers can go quietly into slavery, live in a lie, and bury their heads in the sand, or you can go like a man, squarely facing the truth and fighting for freedom. I honestly believe this, and I honestly believe that the whole nature of the craft is sinister. Wow. That's uh, that's quite a statement there, and uh, I certainly admire you for saying that. I had no idea that you were going to do that. In fact, you showed me the piece of paper just as the music was beginning to fade out and indicated to me that you wanted to uh, say something. So, um, yeah, wow, that's pretty good. Um, okay, let's get uh, on into the, the rest of the program. What are some of the uh, are there other signs and signals that uh, the secret societies, Freemasons in general, use to... Uh, to identify themselves to each other? I've never been a member of any other secret society besides Freemasonry, and uh, <laughs> much to my joy and to your uh, good fortune out there, I have already told you most of the secrets that are protected by the craft, as, as far as the common layman of the craft will know, with the exception of one. And uh, th that is concerning Hiram Abiff, who is a, a bit of a patron saint, I guess, of Freemasonry, somebody they pulled from the Bible and turned into a character to, uh, to give a meaning to their, to their ritual. Um, when, when two Masons come together, one of the easiest ways that they'll come to know each other without having to shake hands, hug in the middle of the street, or do little foot dances, or whatever kind of nonsense that they're, that they're doing out there, they'll just come up and say, well, hi, Hiram, how you doing? Or, hello, Mr. Abiff. Or if you want to catch a Mason on the phone, you just tell them that uh, H. Abiff is calling, and uh, believe me, you'll get service right away. Uh, well, that's good to know. Uh, we can uh, we can certainly use information like that. Um, but we, we know that some of the sig symbols and signals and signs used in the, in the Masonic uh, order were also used by uh, the Knights Templars and others. So this didn't come strictly from this one society, but literally they are all one. What are some of the vocal signals, uh, uh, the speech, uh, what words? Uh, Besides Hiram Abiff, what else would you say to someone to solicit whether or not they were, uh, in fact, Freemasons? Uh, one of them that, uh, that that I've also come across, and I've seen this in writing, and, and it's, it, it was a bit of a mystery to me until I until I, I sought some some advice about it. They'll ask each other if they're a if they're a traveling man, and what they mean by and this comes directly from the old Templar uh, old Templar ritual, and uh, and it stands as a positive factual link. Of, uh, of the continuity between ancient secret societies and modern Freemasonry is they'll ask if they're a traveling man. And the meaning behind that is one traveling from west to east, east being the source of knowledge. Or illumination. Ah. It's also the point where the sun rises, which goes back to the first religion, which was the cosmology, where all of these religions and secret societies sprang from, which was the worship of the sun, the source of illumination, the source of the source of all life, the source of everything, rises in the east every morning and is, in fact, <laughs> for those who really understand, the morning star. 
Is that not correct? <laughs> Absolutely, and that uh, that gives a great illumination, if I may, <laughs> if I may say so, as to why the worshipful master sits in the east of the lodge, and uh, and also why during the ritual, when a uh, a young a young unknowing Freemason like myself is brought in and has a degree conferred upon him, he circumnavigates it as he walks around in a circle from all the points of the lodge, going from the worship master in the east to the junior warden in the uh, south to the senior warden in the west and then back to the master in the east. He is traveling as the earth travels around the sun in a, uh, in a, in a circle of worship. And it might even be a direct reference to Solomon's circle. And, uh, and if you've told me yourself, uh, Bill, about the traveling man, that too has been used by communists, uh, hasn't it? Uh, yes, in fact, uh, anybody who knows anything about the International or the secret society known as the International, the International, the Communist Party, uh, the International Socialists, Socialism, if you studied them, um, the same passwords are used by them. All of these organizations are one. Socialism stems from the mystery schools. That's where it comes from. Um, you'll find that most of the mystery schools preach the tenets of the um, uh, of the Communist Manifesto, written by Karl Marx and Frederick Engels, uh, whom, by the way, didn't just wrote it. They were the hacks who fronted for it. They did not make it up. It came out of of ancient uh, documents and and an ancient philosophy. And uh, the password is the same. Are you a traveling man? And that's how communists identified themselves to each other from cell to cell and country to country and, and uh, uh, kept their business secret. And I got that straight out of the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation and in their investigations of the international, the international, um, the Communist Party, international socialism. They're all the same. Freemasonry, uh, the Knights of Malta, uh, the Rose and Cross, they're all the same organization, folks. And one of the, remember, one of their tenets is, and, and in fact, Adam Weishaupt said this, the strength of our order lies in its concealment and in, in its many different names, appearing under many different names and many different occupations, sometimes even uh, appearing to oppose ourselves. But at the highest levels, they're all the same. Because they use the system uh, to coerce the people to go along what they want. If they want to change something in a certain direction, they'll look at the population, the society, uh, the problems that, that exist, and they will intentionally create, foment a problem in order to get the people to cry for an answer to that problem which will be the direction that they want to take that society into. They will create two opposing groups. At the top of these two opposing groups will be their people so that it's a controlled conflict bringing about a controlled resolution or a controlled, a desired end. Um, and you, you guys better wake up to this. I'm telling you, you better wake up to it. You better pay attention to what you're hearing here. You better realize that this young man sitting next to me is a hero. He's risking his life to bring you this information, as are many other people operating out of the public eye. You may never, ever in your life know who they are. They're working to save your freedoms for you. And sometimes I have to sit back and watch it. Why are we all doing this? Why am I doing this? Why is he doing this? Why are all these people doing this when most of you out there sit back and do nothing? I have people write me letters and say, I don't want to be in your mailing list because I might, somebody might get your mailing list and, and they might know who I am. I've had other people write and say, what is that uh, that symbol that's that's over your name when you sign your name on your documents? That's 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 the sign of uh, of something evil, and I don't want to be a part of your organization. That's fine with me, folks. Um, to tell you what that is, for those of you who are interested, that's a chop. It was given to me as a gift by the head of the accounting department of the last college where I was the executive director. She was Chinese, went home to Hong Kong for Christmas, and brought that back for me. That's the way the Chinese people sign their name. It literally means the director, the boss. And uh, I've used it ever since because it's I, I like it, and I liked her, and it was a gift. And it personalizes my signature. It means nothing more or less than that. But you are right in asking, but you are wrong in assuming and making assumptions. 
You're also wrong in hiding. I want you to read my lips. New world order. There's no place where you can go and hide unless you can get off this planet. And forget about aliens bringing all this stuff about. The only people you have to fear are humans. And uh, uh, being afraid is not going to solve our problems because fear itself is a weapon that they use against us. So, I mean, why, if, if the majority of people are sheeple and aren't going to help save their own butts, why should, why should you be doing this to save them, Will? Why are you doing this? I have a very, very easy answer for your question, and you already know the answer. I, it's obvious that you're doing this for the, for the sake of your audience. Whenever you look at your daughter, whenever you, I look at my family, whenever I slap my dog upside the head, that's why I'm doing it, because I love people in this world, and I love my people, and my people are not going to be safe un until I can make this world safe. I see them in direct danger. And, and I'd like to say, Bill, you have a wonderful way of cutting right to the heart of, of many matters. Uh, you're right about the continuity of the secret societies. They are all one. And, and I'm here to tell you, he did not just flip through a few books and see a couple of things and say, okay, they're all one, they're all evil. It's not that easy, folks. We have to read and research and research and research and investigate every single corner of this. And believe me, if it looks like a snake and it slithers like a snake, and it hisses like a snake, well, well hell, go ahead and step on its head, because it's a snake. And, uh, and, uh, <laughs> uh, well, it is a snake. <laughs> if, if we go right, the philosophy of all of these secret societies is that man was held prisoner in the Garden of Eden by an unjust, vindictive God. That he was denied his own chance to become a God. And that Lucifer, through his agent Satan, set man free with the gift of intellect, the gift of knowledge. And with that knowledge, man himself can become God. Remember, the promise that Satan made to Eve was that God was lying to them. That if they did indeed eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge, they would become gods. Don't ever forget that. Those who say they are God, those who say they are going to become God, the members of the secret societies, the Mormon church, others who profess this belief, are practicing the Luciferian philosophy. They have deserted the real true God, and they are following the fallen angel of light, Lucifer, Satan, who is not a God at all. They have all been deceived. If you are one of them, remember, we don't hate you. We are not trying to hurt you. If you want to continue to practice your religion, that is okay with me and any true person who is an American and who believes in the Constitution. It is only when you practice your religion with the aim of taking away my freedoms and forcing me to practice your religion under a new world totalitarian socialist government which you intend to bring about that it becomes not only my business but my duty to stop you. Understand that. And I want to read to you from a book here so that you'll understand where I'm getting to. And I want you to listen very closely to the closing music at the end of our program tonight. This is taken from uh, secrets, the Secret Societies of All Ages and Countries. It's in two volumes. It's, uh, the author is Hecate Thorne. This particular set of uh, two volumes was published, I believe, in 1965 by University Books Incorporated. The Library of Congress number is 65-22572. So I urge you to get this set of books because these books were written back when it was still easy to get a lot of information on the existing secret societies, much easier than it is today. Um, I want to read to you from page 14 of volume 2 under Secret Societies, Freemasonry, Rights and Customs, uh, paragraph uh, 391 entitled Masonic Customs. Some Masonic peculiarities may conveniently be mentioned here. Freemasons frequently attend in great state at the laying of the foundation stones of public buildings. They follow a master to the grave. Clothed with all the paraphernalia of their respective degrees, they date from the year of light. The Knights of the Sun, the 28th degree of the Scotch Rite, acknowledge no era, but always write their date with seven noughts, or zero, 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 zero. 
No one can be admitted into the Masonic order before the age of 21, but an exception is made in this country and in France in favor of the sons of Masons who may be initiated at the age of 18. Such a person is called a Louis in England, and that's the source of that name, and a Louveteau in France. This latter word signifies a young wolf. And the reader will remember that in the mysteries of Isis, the candidate was made to wear the mask of a wolf's head. Hence a wolf and a candidate in these mysteries were and are synonymous. Macrobius in his Saturnalia says that the ancients perceived a relationship between the sun, the great symbol of these mysteries, and a wolf. For as the flocks of sheep and cattle disperse at the sight of the wolf, so the flocks of stars disappear at the approach of the sun's light. We have seen in the account of the French workmen's unions that the sons of Solomon still call themselves wolves. The adoption of the Louveteau into the lodge takes place with a ceremony resembling that of baptism. The temple is covered with flowers incense is burnt, and the Godfather is enjoined not only to provide for the bodily wants of the newborn member, but also to bring him up in the school of truth and justice. The child receives a new name, generally that of a virtue such as veracity, devotion, beneficence, and the Godfather pronounces for him the oath of apprentice in which degree he is received into the order, which in case he should become an orphan, supports and establishment establishes human life. Now the key words here, folks, that I want you to remember and pay very close attention to when you hear the closing theme or the music that closes this program tonight is this, and I'm going to quote directly from it. Quote, Macrobius in his Saturnalia says that the ancients perceived a relationship between the sun, the great symbol of those mysteries, and a wolf. For as the flocks of sheep and cattle disperse at the sight of the wolf, so the flocks of stars disappear at the approach of the sun's light. Now remember in chapter 1 of my book, Silent Weapons for Quiet Wars, there is a quote of these people who have declared a silent, quiet war upon the American people using silent weapons that goes like this. Quote, A nation or world of people who will not use their intelligence are no better than animals who do not have intelligence. Such people are beasts of burden and stakes on the table by choice and consent." Unquote. In other words, cattle. I prefer to call them sheeple, the sheeple of the world. And of course, if they are the wolves, if they are the wolves, then you are the stakes on the table if you are indeed one of the sheeple. Well, that takes us almost up to the mark. Will, I want to thank you once again, and since this is the last uh, program that we're going to be doing together for quite a while, I'm going to give you the next uh, 30 seconds to um, tell the people out there, the sheeple, what they should hear. Uh, thank you, Bill. Uh, there's only one message for the sheeple of the America, of America, and that is, bah. As for my family, I love you. And, and we're out of time once again. For all of you who have been helping in this great fight, God bless you. For the rest of you, God bless you too. But God help you to wake up in time. <laughs>